I started uh, my, my formal leadership career in America as a deputy principal, a very, very large high school in Houston, Texas. Um, and all the schools I was principal of were, were, were large. They, they all had uh, anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 kids and a staff of about, a, including all your um, other staff, and along with teachers, probably about 185 staff in all those schools. So they're big towns every day. And I started my career as a deputy in, in one of those big towns. It was Langan Creek High School in Houston, Texas. And um, I had a, a partner, his name was Marvin Webster. He was the other deputy. And our responsibility was student behavior. We were to make 2,500 kids behave every day. Um, a daunting, daunting chore in a tough, tough, uh, tough uh, high school that had a lot of the major gangs in America enrolled, enrolled in the school. And what we feared more than anything between school years and between school years in America, the months of June, July, August, somewhere in that span, we have summer recess before the new year starts in September. A big fear Marvin and I had was getting a manila envelope. That's how long ago 1985 was. You got things in envelopes still. We, we feared getting an envelope from the regional office in the middle of the summer. That was an event we did not look forward to because we knew as soon as we would open that manila folder up, there'd be something new we needed to do. Happened in the summer of 1985, a manila envelope showed up. I looked at it, shouted out the office door, Marvin, we need to talk. And Marvin and I collided in the hallways between our two offices. I said, Marvin, do you see this stupid new rule we're supposed to enforce when school starts? Marvin said, it's the most stupid new rule I've ever seen, Bill. Why don't you go talk to the regional director about it? I said, I'm not going to go mess with any regional director, Marvin. I'm trying to get promoted to principal. You go, Marvin. <laughs> Marvin said, I'm always in trouble with the regional director, Bill. I'm not going to go. Let's just figure out how to enforce this stupid new rule. It was a rule for boys. It says, as of up, as up September 1st, 1985, no boy will be allowed to come to school if their hair goes below the top of a dress shirt collar. I said, Marvin, that's not enforceable. We can't enforce that rule. It's impossible. He said, we need to figure it out. We need to enforce that new rule, Bill. I said, the boys are going to hate it. They're going to get angry when they come back. He says, we need to enforce the rule, Bill. So we figured out how to enforce the rule. A great pattern of behavior Marvin and, I, Marvin and I ran in the school is we had to watch students behave at lunchtime for two hours every day. 650 kids at a time would come in for 30 minutes. Eat lunch, leave, the next 650 would come in. That's how we spent two hours of our day managing that pattern of behavior. Kids eating lunch, adolescents eating lunch. We said that's where we can enforce the rule. Kids are going to come to school on September 1st. They're going to have to come into the lunchroom and we'll look at them. The boys will look at. Oh, he looks okay. I don't know about him. A little shaggy, he's okay. So we would go up to boys whose hair we thought was too long and we'd give them a, a letter to take home to mom and dad. Here's a letter to take home to mom and dad. It has a new hair rule in it. I don't know whether you're in compliance or not. Take the letter home. I'm going to call you into my office in a week. I'm going to put a dress shirt on you. If your hair goes below the collar, you go home until you get a haircut. If your hair is above the collar, we send you to class. Got it? That's a lousy new rule, Mr. Martin. I said, I know, but it's a rule. And we enforce the rules here at this school. So we started handing those, those hair letters out. End of the first day, I asked Marvin, how, how'd the boys take the new hair letters, Marvin? He said, they hate it, they're getting angry. They got angrier and angrier and angrier for three weeks until September 20th, 
1985 at 12.05 p.m. happened. Marv and I are talking on walkie-talkies in the lunchroom. Last lunch of the day, he and I are talking about what pub we're going to go to as soon as school was over, because we're tired of that damn new hair roll. Bang! I heard a, a noise from that side of the cafeteria I'd never heard before. Kids all stood up on the, on the stools of the cafeteria tables. And I started walking to the sound. As I walked to the sound, about where that door is, a boy came around the cafeteria tables, all dressed in black, with a 357 Magnum in his hand. He pulled down on me in a police stance. And I remember thinking, I'm going to die. I'm going to die right here. Crack! Shot me. Hit the brick wall next to me. Ricocheted and shattered the leg of a boy standing behind me. And everyone dived under the cafeteria tables. To the day I die, I don't know why I took a step toward that boy. I think it's just because I'm a big man. And when he shot at me, my momentum was just took me that way. But when I took a step toward him, he turned, he ran. He ran around back where he came. He ran to the top of the stairs. And I thought he was going to shoot down at us from up on top. So I shattered everybody under the, under the stools next to me. Get out, get out, because their exit door is the opposite way. The kids nearest me heard me. They started running out. Everybody else saw them. Everybody else started running out in that cafeteria, empty in a nanosecond. And I'm still walking around. I come around the corner, and I see the result of the first crack. Marvin's laying on the ground in a pool of blood. And I remember leaning over him and him telling me, I asked him a stupid question. I said, Marvin, what happened? He said, I've been shot. It's serious. I need to be life flighted to Herman Hospital. Hell on earth started for us at that moment in time. And we, because Marvin and I chose to manage the school instead of lead it. We chose to manage the school instead of lead it. Let me explain. John and I have taken the levels of perspective model developed by Kim and we've used it to define the difference between leadership and management. Leaders work at the upper three levels of perspective. Leaders help the people they lead develop a vision of the future. Leaders help the people they lead know the mental models they need to live to realize that vision. Leaders design the systems and structures that need to be in place to live out those mental models so you can re realize your vision. Managers work at the lower levels of perspective. They take care of events. They deal with patterns of behavior ad nauseum. And they deal with the, they run the systems and structures that are in place. Notice the middle line. Systems and structures has this line in the middle. That's because leadership is designing new systems and structures. Management is running the systems and structures that already exist. So here comes a new hair rule to Marvin and I. Pattern of behavior for us. We're going to get manila envelopes from the regional office and where there's going to be mandates in them. Mandates that we have to enforce. This one was the most stupid rule we'd ever seen. I will take to my grave, ignoring it. Because I was a manager. I was doing what I was told. I was managing the systems and structures that that school district had put in place. And Marvin's paralyzed for life because the bullet shattered his tailbone. John Cotter, who's written a neat little book called Leading Change, 
says organizations and schools or organizations are overmanaged and underled. Cotter says that more than 80% of what goes on in a school today is management work, not leadership work. I was like that. I was like Cotter's research when I started as a leader. I was a manager and bad things happened because I was managing a school instead of leading it. If you're spending 80% of your time down here just dealing with events and patterns of behavior, your school will go nowhere. It will go nowhere. The place to be is up here. Well, oh, there I did it again. The place to be is up here at vision, mental models, and systems and structures. That's where leaders work. I tried as hard as I can for 20 years in the American system to do more leadership work and less management work. John still calls me a failure at that. When I started, I was like Cotter. More than 80% of my time was managing. Less than 20% of my time was leading. After 20 years, when I think of that as a seesaw, how much time did I actually spend managing and leading when I left to do this kind of work? In the end, I was doing 65% leadership work, 35% management work, and John called me a failure. He said I didn't get it high enough to lead. Schools need you to lead. And I'm talking about you need to have at least 80% of your time leading and 20% managing. And I worked this guy really hard as his coach to help him shift. He said, I've never led a school, he's right. But you need to fight for leadership time. Schools need strong leadership. And you need to get it to 80% leadership. You've got to do some management, I accept that. But any more than 20%, I believe you're ineffective. Turn and have a talk to each other about that. How are you balanced right now in your professional life? What percentage of time are you spending managing? What percentage of your time are you spending leading? Have a good chat.